Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us after the pandemic, which you didn't get to travel as much, I guess. Yes, not <laughs> as much as I would have liked, but yes. uh, things are looking up now. So, Did you manage to go anywhere? I you did, know? I did. I managed to escape quite a bit this year, actually. <laughs> I've, been, uh, yeah, I've been away for probably about four of the, four of the months this year, so it's, it's not been too bad. Things are on the up. Yes. Well, I bet the opening question for you is going to be very predictable. You're truly an explorer. You must share with us one of your most memorable adventures you've, you've gone on to and why. Um, my most memorable adventures. So if I sort of take it back to um, sort of the early days, actually, I think for me, it all really began. One of my, my most formative uh, adventures, I suppose, was at the age of 22. I, I, I studied history at um, the University of Nottingham and uh, I sort of specialised, my, my sort of dis dissertation was in um, travel writing, so it came in quite useful, unlike uh, a lot of people that study history that never get to use it again. But um, I, I wanted to go on, on an adventure that, that, really, um, that really sort of enabled me to sort of dig into that. So I hitchhiked from, uh, from Nottingham, where I was studying, to India along the, 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 the ancient sort of Silk Road. And, um, and that, for me, was probably one of the most memorable because that, that was, for me, was where it all started at the age of 22. Um, traveling through the likes of Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, Iran, all these places that the media told me not to go to, mm -hmm. actually that was left a deep impression because um, going there and seeing places with, with your own eyes um, enabled me to sort of be a bit more analytical in my thinking. So that that really was was a, was a great adventure, not not just in teaching me the the importance of independence and and, and sort of critical thinking, but also uh, it, it meant that you know that was gap year number two, and uh, I've never really stopped since. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the places you've mentioned, the Silk Road, you visited once when you were young, and how how do you feel when you return to the same place? Mm. Do you have a different perspective? Do you feel differently? Yeah, so I so I actually wanted to repeat some of that journey. So in 2017, I, I managed to convince Channel 4 to uh, to fund an expedition to actually go and um, recreate part of that journey. So I, I travelled from the Russian city of, of Sochi on, on the Black Sea to into Iran, going across all of the North Caucasus, um, uh, into Azerbaijan, Georgia, and then finishing in in Iran. Um, and it was it was fascinating to go back, you know, a decade later and and see how things had changed or not. Mm -hmm. um, had they changed? I mean, places like that, things sort of tend to be quite cyclical and cyclical. And and, and actually, I, I was very fortunate to go and visit the same people in, in some mm -hmm. cases. Um, there was one story. I there was a there was a chap that I met um, the first time around back in two thousand and four. I was in uh, Georgia, and. Uh, I was sort of arriving late into this little town um, late at night one one day and had nowhere to sort of sleep. And um, this this journey, bear in mind, was was something I was doing. I'd just graduated. I had literally no money. I think I had about sort of five hundred pounds mm -hmm. in my bank account, and that had to get me home as well. So I was hitchhiking all the way, living off the land, sleeping rough, whatever I could do. And um, when I arrived in Georgia. Um, I, I basically slept the night on a park bench, um, sort of just on the outs, outskirts of this little village and woke up to hear a couple of uh, quite drunk men shouting around me. And um, one of these gentlemen sort of invited me into his house and I, I had no idea what was, good, what was gonna happen, but I wasn't really in a position to say no. And uh, he proceeded to um, feed me the local moonshine uh, which they call chacha, and, um, and I, I was drinking this stuff, and uh, you know, at least I was getting a bed for the night. So I, I slept the night, and, and the following morning woke up with a bit of a hangover at sort of nine o'clock. Uh, this chap had left the house, and I thought, well, okay, I better don't want to be rude, so I'll, I'll wait for him to come back. He was a farmer, so he, he came back sort of mid to late morning, and I was about to try and leave again, and uh, he was like, you know, another bottle came out and said, we need to drink again. So I, I, um, I, I carried on, you know, drinking with this gentleman. And um, the next morning, the next night, this this carried on all day. And the next night, it, um, it exactly the same thing happened. But I thought I'm not going to be tricked into this the second yeah. time. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna leave before he gets back from his farming duties. So I, I went out the front door. I wrote a nice note for this gentleman saying thank you very much for your hospitality, but I really need to get on with my journey. But the problem is he had a big wolf in his garden, so I couldn't couldn't escape. 
So, um, so I resigned myself to my fate and waited for him to come back from the fields. And yet again, more chacha came out, which he proceeded to, to feed me. Um, and we, we got drunk yet again so for a third night on the trot. The, the, on the third morning, however, that was it. I was, I was out of there. I had to climb out of the window onto the neighbor's roof and do a runner across the garden um, to escape the wolf. Um, but the funny thing about all that was when I went back in 2017, mm -hmm. Um, however many years later, 13 years later, I thought, I've got to go and find this guy. And um, I did. I managed to somehow find the village, find his house. And, and, you know, to my surprise, I knocked on the door and there he was. And he looked at me and said, ah, Englishman. He remembered me. And literally the first thing he did was pull out a bottle of this chacha. <laughs> and uh, his name was Gotcha, which is quite an, ama quite an amazing guy. Yeah. Sure, all the hospitality is a good reflection of the culture. As, as a student of history, the, the early destinations you've selected, is there a certain influence you want to go mm. for the culture, exploration, or for the nature? Uh, so uh, the places that I wanted to visit on my, some of my early expeditions were, were places that were reflected in um, you know, the themes and, and places that I'd studied at university, particularly um, you know, the Silk Road was of interest. Um, I read a lot about East African history. Mm -hmm. Um, British colonial history. So my, my expedition really reflected those areas of interest. Um, and then over the last decade, since I've been doing this sort of thing for TV, um, I've tried to expand it to incorporate um, some of the causes that I'm involved with, conservation in particular. Um, I'm an ambassador for, for charities like UNICEF and so on. So what I always try and do is incorporate um, useful or you know positive um, aspects to these journeys by highlighting um, uh, causes that, that need uh, need a, a spotlight on them yeah so you mentioned you studied travel writing it seems to me that you've always prepared to go explore and to to travel has that always been the plan or you know you have you ever considered as most people here mm. uh, finding a nine to five job <laughs> after they leaving uni um I'm proud to say I, I had a nine to five job once. It lasted for about um, four days um, for a, a recruitment firm when I was about 21. But no, I, I, ever since I was about 10 years old, I, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. Um, and I remember my, my father was a teacher and I grew up, you know, reading lots of stories about exploration. Shackleton, Scott, David Livingston, all of these, um, you know, greats of Victorian early 20th century exploration. And I thought, you know, if they could do it, then why can't I? Even though, you know, gone are the days of wearing pith helmets and khaki shorts and, you know, shooting tigers, thankfully, there is there is still a lot of world to see. And, and I remember growing up thinking, you know, how, how does this happen? And um, after reading a lot of the biographies and, and so on, I figured that a lot of these explorers had been in the military and that that was how it started for them so i i decided from quite a young age that i was going to join the the british army my grandfather mm -hmm. served in the um in the second world war in burma um, my dad was a you know in, in what was then known as the territorial army mm -hmm. so i it was kind of in my in my genes a little bit that 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 was almost certainly going to happen but i thought on top of that that would give me the life experience and i suppose also the network frankly to be able to to go and um explore the world and and uh, and so that's what i did i went to you know after studying at university i went to sandhurst um, spent 12 months there and then ended up in the parachute regiment um, where I was then obviously sent straight back to Afghanistan after having been there as a as a civilian sort of backpacker in, in my early travels. So it was a very different experience the second time around. Mm. Are there any valuable takeaways that lessons you've learned in the army that served you really well mm. on your expedition? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't know if anyone here is in the, the officer training corps. Oh, yeah, a couple of guys there. So yeah, I, mean, I think... Um, that for me was 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 my introduction to to the military, doing it part time at university. Um, then you know Sandhurst was was a real um, eye opener because I'd I'd got used to my freedom at this stage. You know, like I say, I, I managed to hitchhike to to India and go through places like Afghanistan and Iran and and come back in one piece. So to then go be shouted at by a sergeant major was was um, quite a humbling experience. But I think it it did give me a number of very useful lessons in in discipline, in understanding risk and how to mitigate risk. You know, just now, you know, if I go to, if I'm, photo you know, being a photographer in, I don't know, Afghanistan now or Syria or I'm going to places where there's a lot of, you know, men with guns, doesn't automatically mean that you're going to sort of get shot at necessarily. It sometimes mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. But um, 
but but having that understanding, that concept of risk, that's what the army did for me. It it sort of gave me a, a more broader and um, appreciation of of when things um, could go wrong. Um, but I think combining that with my experience in in the big wide world outside of the army is, is a nice balance because I think a lot of my friends that that, that join the army and haven't done necessarily anything else mm-hmm. are constantly on on their guard, always looking for dangerous situations. And actually, I think it's sometimes better to to step back and whilst understand risk, not be not be too scared to to push the boat out sometimes. Yeah, I think recently you've done a lot of writing on kind of leadership and with some of the lessons mm. you learned from the army. And what stood out to me is you said a good leader don't shout at people. You know, do you want to expand on that? What, in your opinion, is good leadership? I think my, you know, what I learned from my time, not just at Sandhurst and in the Paras, it's keeping a, a cool, a level head, I think, is is the most important facet. If you're running around like a, a headless chicken, then it, it, your soldiers are not going to follow you because they're going to think that you're out of control. And um, one example would be, I mean, I was in I was in Syria back in 2018, and this was in the middle of the fight against ISIS and, and the civil war. There was still a lot of uh, conflict going on. And... Um, the, there was one occasion we were driving from Homs back to Damascus down the main highway and it was getting a bit dark and uh, the petrol light went on in, our, in, in my crew vehicle. And um, we thought, you know, running out of fuel, a bit like UK today. Mm-hmm. And um, we, uh, luckily we, we, we found an actual, I, I, I wouldn't call it a petrol station, but it was, uh, it was like this sort of bombed out um, fuel pump at the side of the road in the middle of the desert and a little shop selling, you know, coffee and tea and things. So perfect. Pulled in to, uh, to, to, to refuel. And while I was waiting, I went to the, to the shop to buy a, to buy a coffee. And then this, this coach pulls into the, the, the forecourt and I wondered who this could be. And, um, so lot basically there's about sort of 40 or 50 young men got off this bus and they were all dressed in, in the, you know, dripping with grenades, rocket launchers and black bandanas. And I thought, oh dear, this, this, this looks like trouble. And, um, one of the young guys came over to me and, and we were all sort of dressed sort of slightly covertly so that, mm-hmm. that we, we didn't stand out. And um, this this lad said to me, you know, salam alaikum. And I replied in my best Arabic, wa alaikum salam. And then he said something else in Arabic and I hadn't got a clue. Um, and then he sort of squinted at me and said, uh, said so in perfect English, he said, so where are you from? I said, well, there's no point lying. He said, I said I'm, I'm from England. He said, oh, I really love England. Actually, I've been many times. And I thought, here we go. This is G. Haddy John and his friends. <laughs> uh, and um, <laughs> I thought, keep the conversation. I said, so who are you guys? And um, he said, oh, we're the Islamic State. At which point my face went white and my trousers, frankly, went another color. Um, <laughs> but then he burst out laughing. He slapped me on the back and said, I'm only joking. We're Hezbollah. <laughs> and it was well, it was Hezbollah, and um, but he was a, he was a, you know he was a very very nice young young guy. He bought me a coffee and explained that he was on his gap year fighting with Hezbollah against ISIS, volunteering uh, before going to university. I said, "Which university are you going to?" And he said, "I'm just doing my UCAS application for Leeds next year." So <laughs> very very bizarre situation. Um, but like I say, you've got to keep a level head in those sorts of circumstances. Yeah. That's quite an experience, yeah. <laughs> um, well, this summer, all eyes were on Afghanistan, and mm. you've traveled to Afghanistan. I don't know, quote you, you described your first encounter of Afghanistan in your book, Eastern Horizon. I felt a combination of fear and excitement. And the prospect of entering a country notorious for bloodshed and a predilection of disposing of foreigners by the most grisly of means. What's your first impression of the country, and how has that changed? <laughs> So the first time I was in Afghanistan, 2004, this was, you know, as you recall, it sort of a couple of years after the um, fall of the Taliban, but it was still very much in flux. But I'd say it was probably the safest time to have been there almost in the last 20 years because there was a window as the Taliban had been defeated before they rose again. So actually, in in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't uh, as dangerous as as it became much later. But as a 22 year old just turning up on my own and at this stage i'd completely run out of money because i'd i'd got as far as iran and um you know you, you can't you can't change travelers checks in iran and this was well before the days of sort of money you know tapping on your contactless card um not that you could probably do that in most places in afghanistan either but i i had no money arrived in herat and i had to um barter 
and I had to sort of swap my, you know, uh, my sleeping bag for a rug and, and these sorts of things in order just to be able to sort of um, stay alive. And uh, so it was terrifying. And, and to go into a country where everyone's armed and especially one that I'd, you know, seen the news about the Taliban, it was it was quite a quite the experience. But bizarrely, it, it, it's one of... Um, it, the irony of this occupation is that often it's not the most, you know, it's not the getting shot at or chased by lions or, or sort of having spears thrown at you. All of those things have happened to me, but but they are not the the most common. It's always the, the like, you know, it's getting in a car accident, frankly, which is always the most terrifying thing. And, and that happened on that journey. I was going over a mountain pass and the brakes failed in, in, um, in my van. And, um, Luckily, we managed to sort of avoid going off the edge of a cliff and, and crashing into a, another another vehicle. So, but but that it, when you're that really brings it home because if you're in the middle of nowhere, as we were in the in the well, as I was on my own in in the middle of the Hindu Kush mountains, mm-hmm. my mum thought I was on holiday in Greece. So if I'd have gone off the edge of that cliff, <laughs> she would have um, yeah she wouldn't have known where I was, frankly. So, wow, yeah. I mean, uh, alongside those, we saw the U.S. troop withdrawing from mm-hmm. Afghanistan you know, where the Taliban took over really rapidly. Yeah. Some of the images we saw on, on the news are really heartbreaking. Yeah. As someone who lived there and yeah. served there, what went through your mind? Well, it was very poignant to see what, what happened and, and, and so quickly mm-hmm. as well. And um, it was actually my old regiment, um, parachute regiment was sent out to um, to secure Kabul airfield. And uh, and actually some of my friends were, were out there. So I was speaking to them as as this was unfolding a friend of mine was about 70 feet away from the the bomb when it went off at the gates um but my yeah my, for about a week my phone was non-stop from friends and friends of friends in afghanistan saying i need to get out you know mm-hmm. and so um luckily I, we were able to sort of between the veterans network between people of my sort of intake who served there about 2008 2009 time we we set up this quite effective method of putting people in touch with the the serving soldiers to get them extracted so we managed to rescue a few families i mean i got about three families out but in you know still not many considering the amount of people that, that sadly are still stuck there people that that were that were helping um, the british army the americans um you know i think it felt like a, a big betrayal to to the people of afghanistan mm. to allow that to happen in the way that it happened i mean i'm not saying we should be staying there forever but i think the way in which in which it was handled by by the politicians on on both sides of the atlantic was was, was just very disappointing mm-hmm. so this is some of them among your dangerous travel experiences but you've also been to places that other students, our members here, would also travel. Um, but some of the student members uh, have the privilege to travel a lot, but not all of them. What would you say to people who haven't really traveled much, have very yeah. little travel experiences, who want to explore part of the world mm. they're not familiar with? What's your advice to them? Well, I'd say, I mean, you know, it's been a, it's been a difficult time for, for, for all concerned, you know, when it comes to traveling and, and I, my heart goes out to those that have got, you know, gap years planned or trips planned because, you know, what a, what a terrible um, shame to have to put those on hold. But the world will come back online and I'd encourage everyone to travel um, wherever you want to go. Just go out there and do it because for me it was it's been the biggest part of my life, you know, and and I did what a lot of young people do at the age of 18, you know, well before I started doing the the more adventurous thing was just go away on a gap year. And I (laughs) went to Thailand and I went to India and I went to these sorts of places and it it was wonderful. And um, I think for me, it was just feeling that sense of hospitality, going to places, uh, meeting real people in, in, in places that um, you wouldn't just go on a normal two week holiday. And and that really changed my outlook on life. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was 18, I went to Nepal and um, there was a, a coup happened. The, the Maoists would take, took over and there was, there, was a, there, was a, there was a lot going on. I seem to sort of attract this sort of trouble wherever I go. I find myself in these sorts of places. But, um, but what happened is I was, my, my passport got stolen. So I was stuck in Nepal. I couldn't get home. And um, this local lad called Binod basically came up to me and said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll take you trekking until all of this calms down. I was 18 or 19 and I said, look, I'm really sorry, but I've got no money. I can't pay you. And, um, you know, I can't even change a traveler's check because I don't have a passport. And he said, don't worry, you'll come back one day and pay me. I thought that that was, that was quite remarkable. And, um, so off we went and, um, that was back in 2001. And, um, 
I've been back to Nepal five or six times and we've stayed friends the whole time. And uh, now his one year, what, what was then his one year old uh, kid is now, you know, grown up studying at university. And it's been a real privilege. I've, I've sort of paid for him to go to university and, and grow up. And it's just those connections with people um, over a lifetime are what makes all of these travels worthwhile, I think. Wow, that's truly remarkable. Mm. Uh, do you have any special travel hobby, uh, hobby, hobby? Habits. habits. Yes, yeah, you would have. As you do, you mm. bring a book with you. Do you bring anything special with you? I, uh, you know what, I, I try these days. If I'm going on a, the longer the journey, the shorter the, the, the smaller the bag. I, I tend to sort of that's my rule of thumb because if I'm traveling, you know, the Nile journey that I, when I walked the, the River Nile, that was four thousand two hundred miles or so. Uh, it took me nine months, and you you simply can't carry enough sort of snack bars to keep you going. So you have to re- rely on on things that you can pick up. And the same goes for for clothes and everything else. So I just try and travel as light as possible. Don't take any luxuries. If it's not if you're not going to use it every day, it doesn't go in the bag. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to be really disciplined and strict with yourself. Um, but of course, there are certain things I I, I take everywhere on, on a trip. You know, whether it's my camera or a compass, just in case I lose my phone. You know, it's uh, those are the essentials. But no, I, I pack light. And just put your faith in humanity, really, and and that's what gets me through it. Um, and I think that's what motivates me. Um, mm-hmm. I think one of my favourite countries is is the Sudan. Mm-hmm. On, on my Nile journey, I was uh, it was probably the lowest ebb of my of my whole of any of my expeditions. I I walked for six months, you know, all the way through Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda. Every tragic thing that possibly could have happened had happened at this stage. I had sadly had a um, a journalist who, who died on the journey, which, which was, which is a horrific experience to go through. So I was, I was questioning everything at this point. And it, I just reached the, the Southern fringes of the Sahara desert. And I knew that I had another five or six months walking still ahead. So it was, it was pretty tough to keep motivated. And there was the Sahara desert laid out in front of me and I was following the river. And, um, I knew that for this phase, I needed to, to carry lots of water because there were parts where I wasn't going to be able to walk right by the river for security consideration so I thought lots of water I need to carry carry us I'm gonna get some camels so I bought three camels from the camel market but I know nothing about camels so I I had to employ two Bedouin camel drivers to come Mm. with me Mm. and they agreed but only on the basis that we reached the Egyptian border before Ramadan so which was 60 days two months ahead Mm. said okay this is fine we'll 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 make it in two months and I worked did the maths and it was going to be about anywhere between 25 and 30 kilometers a day on average which I'd Figured was was totally fine, so off we went. Now, what I hadn't accounted for was Sudanese hospitality, because walking along the river in these villages, the Sudanese people are so friendly. Mm-hmm. That every village they they come running out, and uh, people, oh come on, I'll, you know, I want to feed you lunch or have a cup of tea, or I want you to teach my children English and things like this. <laughs> and and I was very happy to. And and at the end of the day, I was there to meet people and write a book and, and make a film. So I was quite happy interacting. But my two Bedouin camel handlers, they were getting more and more upset that we were getting falling behind schedule. So um, so they, they, at one point they threatened to mutiny. They said, right, we're going home. You can look after your own bloody camels. And um, so we came to a deal. We said, okay, what we're going to do is we'll do one day walking by the, the river and the villages and speak to people. And then every other day we'll go in the desert a mile away from the village and just go in a straight line to make up for the distance. Mm. The only problem with that is whenever we'd camp out in the desert and make a little fire to fatigue, the locals in the villages would must see the flames and they'd be like, what's going on over there? So I'll never forget, there was one day we were sat there making our tea and then this crowd of people emerged from, from the village, surrounded us, and they were like, what on earth are you doing? And I tried to explain um, that we were avoiding hospitality, which comes across as very ungrateful. Uh, one guy, one guy was so upset he stormed away and he came back half an hour later. He carried his bed on his head and said, "If you're not coming into my home, my home is coming to you." And at that moment, something t- switched in my mind. I thought, you know what? Whatever my problems are, no, no matter how bad my blisters are, you know that that sense of warmth and hospitality is what kept me going after that, and, and it just made life a lot easier. Oh, that's a fantastic story. Um, I'm most interested in your journey following other elephants mm. in Botswana. What inspired that um, plan, that journey? So that journey was really, I've always loved elephants. I don't know why. I've always been fascinated by, you know, the, the, these, these big, magnificent creatures that somehow, despite the ravages of humanity on, on the natural world, are, are still out there. I mean, and I did a bit of research in it before this journey because... I wanted to tell the story not just of 
the elephants, but all of all the megafauna and, and, and frankly, the, the natural world in a way um, that perhaps hasn't been 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 attempted before by trying to show it from the elephant's point of view and also the people that live alongside, um, you know, what they see as a threat in, in places like, you know, in Botswana. And... Um, uh, the, the the research that, that that sort of I unearthed was was fascinating. I had no idea just how sociable and intelligent elephants are. We we sort of know that elephants have got a very long memory, but I didn't know, for instance, that elephants can communicate in between their herds. So using a, a very deep um, calling sort of noise in, in in their larynx, they can transmit um, sort of vibrations through through the floor, and they pick them up with their feet and. Some researchers say, suggest that this can this can happen over the over ten or even twenty kilometers, and which would account for the way that whenever there's a a war in parts of Africa, elephants mm-hmm. disappear like that. Or if there's poachers, elephants will 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 send this distress signal to the next herd and the next herd, and it's almost like the the beacons in medieval times that right okay mm-hmm. danger, and that message would get passed on, and therefore elephants can can avoid it. So. Very, very intelligent creatures uh, that really deserve our respect. And um, and so that's what this journey was all about. It was to try and get almost embedded with a, with a herd of elephants and walk with them across um, Botswana, which has got the most elephants out of all the, all the African countries. Um, but to tell the story of, of the elephants, but also the, the, the huge threats that, that they, that, you know, that, that face them. And, uh, you know, when I was born in, in the early 1980s, um, there were, you know, 750,000 elephants, you know, or maybe almost a million. Now there's only 400,000 elephants left, you know, and that's in one lifetime. You know, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the 12 million elephants. So to go down to 420,000 is is tragic. So I wanted to try and make more people aware of, of the, the threat that, that, that they're facing. And it's not just from, from poaching and hunting. Um, that used to be the biggest danger. Now, of course, it's habitat loss, you know, and, um, and the fact that as the human population grows, there's more and more of the natural world is, is being eroded and there's no place for elephants to roam. And elephants need to, need to get to watering holes. They need to, you know, travel along their ancestral migration routes and the more roads we mill build the more fences we put up there's going to be more and more human and wildlife conflict and who's going to come off worse the elephants of course mm-hmm. well it's great you could share with with the audience you know the journey that you went on with a really meaningful message mm-hmm. your most recent book the art of exploration um you're sharing how you first discover what it means to be a traveler in the modern age mm. so what does that mean being a traveler <laughs> explorer in the modern age well my mom likes to call it extreme backpacking um but essentially it's uh you know uh, for me at least i i've always loved travel i've always loved the 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 activity of travel but the theory that you know what what can we gain from it and of course with covid and lockdowns and, and not being able to travel as much mm. it's, it's really brought it home so it, it for the first time gave me the opportunity to really sit down and think about some of the biggest lessons that I've learned from my almost you know 20 years of traveling and and that's what I did I wanted to sort of collate all of these not just the the stories and anecdotes but but the messages behind it and and what I've personally taken away mm-hmm. and also how that can potentially be applied um, in 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 daily life or in business or when you're applying for a job and and so it's very much focused towards the audience of you know people who are in this transition period whether it's you know you're you're leaving graduating from university or whether you've you know quit your job and wanted a new challenge so that's that's who I had in mind when I wrote this book and and it really hopefully I think um, explains a little bit about how how I did it and and, um, and what my motivation and inspiration was. Wow. Well, just a quick plug in his, his new book is being purchased by our library as we speak. <laughs> so surely you can find a copy in our, in our library. Uh, before I move on to audience questions, uh, I just want to end this, uh, our conversation with a question I want to ask a lot of speakers coming this term. What would you tell your uh, 20-year-old self now you've, you've done all this? My 20-year-old self. So I was, what was I doing when I was 20? I was in my second year at university. I mean, I think enjoy the ride because it's all too it's all too easy to get wrapped up in planning and and having goals and and I think they're all it's all very important to have aspirations and be ambitious but don't forget to just enjoy it you know because that's 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 really important too is is to is to just yeah it, life's about the the journey and not just the the destination I think 
Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. Now I'm going to move on to our audience Q&A. Uh, please feel free if you've got a question, put your hands up and I can call you by your name. Uh, please wait for the microphone to get to you and you can stand up and ask a question. Yes. It's, um, it's actually a really great privilege to uh, hear your stories. Um, what would you say is the most important life lesson that you've learned on your adventures? Maybe something like mm. some words of wisdom that you can pass on to all of us. Mm. I mean, I put all those words of wisdom, wisdom in, in my book, so you should go and read that. Um, <laughs> but I, would, I think, um, you know, I, going back to what I sort of alluded to there, you know, I, I remember when I, when I first left the army um, a decade ago now, I was, uh, I was sort of like, what do I do next? You know, I was suddenly faced with, with um, this big life change and... Uh, I remember thinking, you know, why not actually follow through on that boyhood dream that I had since I was 10 um, to be an explorer, whatever that means. And so I, you know, I sat down and uh, did my five year plan and uh, did a budget for it and all these geeky things. And um, I worked out actually, you know, you can you can you can pretty much achieve whatever you want in life with a bit of planning and a, and a healthy amount of confidence that is born out of experience. But really, it just comes down to breaking it down, working backwards, having your, whatever you're in the army, we call it your mission statement, but working it back from that, it's like, it's not, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility to do whatever you want to do and, and, and just make it, make it into manageable bite-sized sort of goals along the way. But don't do that at the expense of, of, of enjoying it. Don't just, just thrash yourself to, to, you know, to achieve something. It's, a, it's, it's often in life, I found it's about, um, how you do something is more important than what you do. So stick to your principles. Don't take no for an answer because, you know, you you all very competent and intelligent people that you can do whatever you want in life. So, yeah, there's a lot of naysayers out there. There's a lot of, don't take advice from somebody who hasn't done what you want to do. Only take advice from those people that have actually achieved what you uh, want to achieve um, because they're the ones that have actually been through that process and, and succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. The hand from the back at the back. Well, thank you very much for coming here and for the talk. Uh, it looks like you had an amazing journey. Uh, one of the things I see that being from the British society and traveling to all those countries often on foreign office website would say, go at your own risk, <laughs> uh, which probably because of what happens in the news, what would you say to a lot of people mm. that should they take that advice for the face value or there is more to those societies as to what they would see uh, in the news or generally, uh, yeah. because I come from one of those. No, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, if you look at the foreign office website, you, I mean, you can't even travel to Belgium these days. I mean, it's sort of, <laughs> um, so, it depends on what your appetite for risk is. I, I sort of, uh, I was quite a wreck, well, I wouldn't say reckless, no, I would say reckless, 22-year-old, but I, I sort of ignored all of that. The hardest bit is getting travel insurance. But like I say, I think that everything's to play for now because you, you can't get travel insurance to go anywhere. So you may as well just go and go to those places that um, you, you're fascinated by. N nothing, I, in my experience at least, you know, very few places are as dangerous or um or you know or tricky to get to as as the news would have you believe um or even the foreign office would have you believe um so yeah i, I i'm not saying you know everyone should go on a holiday to afghanistan tomorrow but maybe you want to and i did and it was fine and, and i learned a lot of very valuable lessons about going to uh places that um you know you you probably would have to think twice about but yeah, I, I think if you've got a burning desire to learn more about a culture, then, you know, obviously do your research. Make sure that you uh, are well read and if you can learn a few words of the language, that will help and, and so on. Um, but, yeah, go and, see, go and see places with your own eyes because nothing can, nothing can stand in for that. Mm. Great. Uh, the front. One getting the microphone here. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, um, oh, so much. Oh, okay. 
Um, so would you uh, describe yourself as a traveller uh, in the first place? I think that's probably the most accurate description. Um, I it's 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 often it depends who's asking. If it's a you know a mortgage broker, then uh, I probably wouldn't say that. Um. <laughs> yeah, because I was also wondering if you would agree um, with, for instance. A description such as a traveler who knows how to do business as well. Yeah, I mean, it, again, it really, in my line of work, uh, well, I suppose any sort of entrepreneurship, um, you have to just uh, amend <laughs> amend your job title as 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 you see fit. Um, you know, my there is no there is no two days that are that are the, really the same for me. I, I, you know, I write books. I'm an author. I I run my own production company um, to make. TV um, documentaries. I will go on assignment and and take photographs for the newspapers or magazines. So I suppose I'm a journalist. Um, but I also uh, run a number of other other smaller businesses um, that are you know and, and uh, you know invest in little things as well. So I think the the key to you know to to life really is keep it interesting by you know dabbling I suppose and see what you're good at. I mean it's good to be. I think, I guess, uh, at your age, it's it's good to specialise in something and and be um, be an expert and so become you know an expert in something that's niche, and then you can kind of grow. But there comes a point where you you do want to diversify a little bit in what your what your activities are, otherwise you just th- there's no sense of progression. Um, so you know, for me, I've always been a bit of a generalist. But when I left the army, I knew I needed to be really good at something. Um, so I thought walking. I'll be really good at walking, and uh, it turns out you can make an entire career about it. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, following up on this, mm. um, your experience in the army, and then you left the army, started this really commercially viable and successful career. Yeah. But when you rejoined the army in, in um, 2012, do you think people treat you differently because of your outside experience when you're coming back to the army? Um, so I, yeah, I was only really out, I suppose. I'd been in the the regular army for five years, left and then came back, and everyone used to just take the mick out of me really for being on TV. And there's there's a lot of banter, I suppose, in in the military environment. Um, but but no, I, I the reason I kind of rejoined and wanted to be a reservist was was more. It kind of kept me a bit grounded. I quite enjoyed being sort of told off by a mustachioed sergeant major. It was quite fun, um, and obviously doing it part time, it was didn't have the the um, the sort of the, the the time constraints that you'd have a trying to do it full time, but the but no, I, I really enjoy being in the reserves, and it's given me a lot of great opportunities. Um, I mean, I, the the job that I, I've been doing for the last sort of nine years in the in the army is is very much it, you know the, what's called seventy seven brigade. It's basically about about the media and. Um, uh, and so it's given me opportunities to go and be a photographer in, you know, I went out to Japan, um, you know, I've been out to Croatia and all over Africa with the reserve. So it's, it's been great. And, um, like I say, it keeps me, keeps me sort of grounded and level headed a bit. Mm, that's great. Uh, any other questions? There's lots of questions. <laughs> um, uh, the guy in the third row. Hello. Thank you very much, Everson, for coming. Um, I was just wondering, given that your <clears throat> experience of hitchhiking Silk Road when you were young, if I want to do it now, given all the COVID restrictions and the war in <laughs> Afghanistan, do you have any advice for that? Yeah, I mean, the COVID's just made everything so difficult, hasn't it? Um, crossing borders, I think, is it, you know, has just become so problematic, and it's it's certainly affected my um, my sort of. Uh, you know, projects in, in in the way that whereas before it would be quite easy to to look at a half a continent like you're sort of describing there. I mean, I was I really wanted to go and do a journey um, the length of South America, but half those borders are closed now. So I, I think there is going to be a bit of a lingering a legacy of of all this. I think it's going to be a good couple of years before there is the confidence to to sort of not just opening borders because that that can change but i think just people's mindsets are going to take a long time to to get used to the, you know what what it was like before in terms of uh, the ease of travel uh, which is a real shame because i i think the travel industry is so important for enabling dialogue and um, and communication between between different people different cultures and uh, you know and when you know when we all go traveling you know you're all ambassadors of your own uh, of your own homelands and and your own way of life and I think that's always such a positive thing because um, 
I think a lot of the the polarization that we see happening in the world today is just because of that lack of dialogue and people not communicating. So COVID has made that a, a, a lot more difficult. So hopefully, you know, I'd say, you know, be those ambassadors, get out there, get traveling and, and uh, do your bit for the world by, by breaking down these, these walls and, and, uh, and encouraging this communication because it's, it's very important. Great. Um, the guy in the second row here. Uh, thanks for your chat today, uh, Leveson. It was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, when you're out traveling, um, how do you best record your thoughts and emotions mm. um, at the time? And does this impinge on living in the moment and experiencing it? And then afterwards, how, do you have to be very careful um, about perhaps romanticizing your travels? Mm. Um, no, that's very, very good points there. Um, so when I first went, you know, when I hitchhiked to it, to India back when I was 22, I purposely didn't take a, a camera. I mean, I had a little, you know, sort of... Uh, you know, Kodak thing, sort of wind up jobby, but I didn't have a, I wasn't invested in the photography side of things. I did keep a diary, but it was very, very, um, it was a sort of a page a day. Um, and that enabled me to, to sort of live in the moment. But you're right, now it's it's tricky, especially if I've got a crew that, that will meet me along the way. I mean, it's it's rare that I'll have a crew the whole time because, you know, directors don't come cheap. And if I'm traveling for six months at a time, then, you know, it, it they, they'll sort of meet me at stages along the way. And uh, the rest of the time, I'm usually just with a local guide, which are the bits I really enjoy, rather than having the whole circus of media that following me around. But, but yeah, I mean, I do feel very... There is a burden of responsibility that comes with um, doing it professionally in that you are always, there is a, an expectation of having a product at the end. You know, if somebody's given you a load of money to make a TV show, you've got to invest the time and energy in, in, in creating that. And, and, and I try and wear different hats by, you know, being a photographer and writing a book. Therefore, I have to keep a detailed notes and, and of course, make TV. So... Um, so yeah, it's busy, and and you're right. One of the biggest things that I've sometimes struggled with has has been just, and, and that's why I said what's the what's the biggest piece of advice is to enjoy the ride. And there were moments over the last sort of particularly three or four years where I've been away, and I'm and actually I'm like, oh, you know, I've I've got to write another bloody book, and it's like I know that that's sort of um, a privileged problem to have, but it, it can sometimes create this this mindset that you know that you're not enjoying it as much as you should be um and that that's definitely something i'm aware of and um you've just got to make time and space for yourself to in to do that and and ha you know there's, there's different ways of doing that and and uh that's something i've had to, to learn to do rather than just work 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 produce something um and actually look back and think actually i can't even remember that trip because i was so busy so yeah, it's a balance. Everything in life's a balance. Yeah. Well, I think by writing books, you're taking more people with you along the journey. And that's why I say it's a privilege because it is a huge privilege to to to, to be an author and and to share those journeys. And um, uh, you know, and it's great when people are inspired and and I get lots of wonderful you know messages and letters and things like that from people who've gone on to do their own journeys. And that that's incredible. And that's that for me is why I continue to do this because. Um, it, it, it's such an honour to be able to to, to sort of uh, encourage other people to, to to see places that perhaps they wouldn't have gone to see themselves otherwise. Do you have any special memorable interactions with mm. you know fans who With read fans. your work and then kind of um, I had a stalker once so that's another that's, that's another matter <laughs> um, yeah I mean you know I, I, I once um, I was once asked to go and present Michael Palin with his Lifetime Achievement Award because apparently he was a fan you know I mean that isn't that amazing that's the stuff like that would, would I was just blown away by um, so yeah no it's, it comes with you know it's opened so many doors and it's it's um, it's been it's been such a wild journey and, and I've met people that I could only have dream, you know, dreamt of meeting, I suppose. That's fantastic. Yeah. There's still a lot of questions. Uh, uh, the guy at the fourth row there. Thank you so much for your talk. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about hitchhiking and obviously visiting countries like Afghanistan and mm. places in the Far East and Middle East, which... I think have different attitudes towards women mm. um, to hear. So I'm just wondering if you had 
any advice to girls who mm. might want to be doing similar things to you and also how you felt your journey or travels might have been different were you a woman? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a very good point. And obviously I can't really sort of speak, uh, from, I can only really speak about my own experiences. But I, w- I suppose um, what I would say is that, yes, there are obviously added risks and considerations, uh, you know, traveling as a, particularly as a solo female. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, particularly in more, my more recent journeys, I've always traveled with a with a guide or not necessarily a, a sort of tour guide, but a companion that has given me access to the cultures, uh, you know, that I've been traveling through, whether that's male or female. Sometimes I've had, you know, a female companion who's who's been able to sort of get me to places that I wouldn't have otherwise traveled to. I mean, in Syria, for instance, actually the best person for the job was 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 this lady called Nada, who was a, a Syrian grandmother, because she just didn't take any shit from anybody. She, um, we were going through all these, you know, mili- militia checkpoints and, you know, all these, you know, men with beards and guns. And she would just shout at them and see this little old lady with her hijab and they all, yeah, in, in you come. So, um, you know, I, I think it, having a companion, somebody you travel with who knows the culture, the language, get you out of trouble when need be, that that potentially is one way of, of mitigating against those risks, somebody you really trust that can, you know, get you get you to those places. And I know lots of, um, you know, female journalists that, that, that live and work in places like Afghanistan or Sudan or wherever and, and can operate uh, quite freely. But you're right, you know, it, that you've got to think about how you how you sort of navigate that. And I think having having a good local person on the ground that can assist with you, you know, is definitely one way. Mm. Great. Any other questions? Uh, the girl on the fourth row there. Yeah, you are in the code. Um, it was so nice hearing you because um, I honestly, I didn't know who you were before visiting here. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> But it's really great hearing you. And I personally lived in all the places that you've mentioned. Um, but from my perspective, it might be very different to yours because I belong to those cultures. Mm-hmm. But can you see, can you tell us a little bit about what is the most common thread or the, the most common thing that you found between all these cultures and people that you were traveling? Yeah, the most common threat. Ooh. Thread. Thread, okay. Um, the most common thread. I would, you know what? The thing that I really enjoyed the most is, is seeking those common threads. Well, what is the commonality that, that joins, um, I don't know, a, a sort of, you know, a, 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 in, somebody from the Inuit community or, or a Sam Bushman from, from uh, Botswana? or um, a, a Kyrgyz goat herder in, in the Wakan corridor of Afghanistan, you know. And actually, I think the the biggest thing actually is, is just, well, one, People generally just want to be left alone to get on with their lives and not not interfered with from by politicians. I've found, um, but I'd say a sense of humour actually, and um, and if you can connect with somebody on whatever level and find that common shared humanity and have a bit of a joke, then all barriers just disappear. Um, and there are different ways of achieving that, um, and it's not a case of just coming up with a you know you know, sort of coming up with a joke and, and hoping they understand, but it's like, what is that? What is the thing that you can share that, that will bring you to the same level? And, and one example I give is, is I was in, um, I was in South Sudan back in 2011, I think it was, or 2012. And, um, we were, we were, there was me and a bunch of guys, mainly from the UN or safari guys rafting down the river Nile. This was before I walked it by, by 12 months or so. So it was a bit of a recce journey. And, um, we got permission to do this. It was the whole point was to encourage tourism in the world's newest country, or what was about to become the world's newest country. And um, so we thought we were doing a good thing. But the only problem was the message hadn't got passed to the local uh, tribes and militias and, and policemen, and and so they just thought we were a bunch of white mercenaries that had come to uh, conquer <laughs> South Sudan. Um, so it was it shouldn't have been much surprise then when as we were floating down this river, um, we we started getting shot at from the bushes and. Um, Basically, you know, we just heard the, heard this gunfire, and then it was honestly, it was like a scene out of Indiana Jones. All these guys running down the river, you know, some had spears, some had guns, um, most of them were quite naked, and um, 
it, it was a very bizarre experience. Then we got chased after, and they were in the dugout canoes and sort of, um, you know, chasing after. And they were saying, shouting to stop, but we couldn't stop because there was lots of rapids and we were getting pulled out of control. So at this point, you know, this we, th this is where sort of worlds collide because, you know, we couldn't speak the language. And um, how do you get out of trouble in that, in that situation? And we got dragged out of these boats eventually. They lined us up against the riverbank, AK-47 in the back of the head. And I thought, this is it. We're gonna, we're, we, you know, we're, this is where the story ends. And then I remembered um, that I'd that I'd got a packet of cigarettes in my pocket for just such an occasion. <laughs> and I looked at this guy, and and I offered him a cigarette. And I could see the, the the sort of cogs turning, and he's like, "Do you want to shoot you, or do you want a cigarette?" And uh, thankfully, the cigarette sort of um, won out. And he he sort of looked at looked around to see if his boss was watching. And I said, "Go on, have a cigarette." And and that just like simple act of. Um, sharing it diffused the whole situation because as soon as he got a cigarette of course they all wanted a cigarette and then the guns were down and within five minutes we were all laughing and joking saying how, how, how hilarious it was but it didn't feel like that at the time but it, you know you've got to find whatever that whatever those those common share you know threads of humanity are and and really tap into them where, wherever you go and uh and, and find something to joke about because it might just save your life well, so the takeaway really is you don't need to learn Always the language. Always carry a pack of cigarettes. Always carry a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take two more questions from the floor. Uh, that's all we probably have the time for. Uh, the girls in the middle. Yeah, you. With your hand up, yeah. Hi, it's been really great to listen to your uh, travels. Um, so I'm a new geography teacher, and mm -hmm. I was just wondering what um, you think that would be uh, inspiration for lots of students who have never left even Oxfordshire, um, mm. what you would encourage uh, us to talk about in lessons to really inspire people to think about mm. the world wider than just their, their village or their county. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good. I think what I was talking about earlier in terms of that that shared humanity, you know, that's totally scalable, isn't it? Because I think, you know, you can just talking to people from different communities, you know, young people, kids can can learn a lot. Um, and for me, I, I remember sort of, you know, my, my geography teacher at school was particularly crusty and, and we were sort of just given lots of facts and figures and it wasn't that interesting. But but just reading about you know, explorers and reading about how people go on journeys and expeditions. That's what got me excited in doing my own. So I think a lot of this, a lot of learning is, is, um, is simply a case of inspiring people and telling stories and storytelling is, is, um, is at the heart of what I've tried to do. Storytelling is at the heart of what teachers do on a daily basis. And I think it's, it's what humans are designed to respond to ever since we were sat around the campfire uh, you know in africa that's that's what that's what humans love to do is is share stories so i think it's inspiring inspiring kids by tapping into that innate curiosity of life which 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 is brought alive by good storytelling and I saw so many bad examples of storytelling in the army because they just bombarded you with powerpoint presentations and pie charts and lots of boring words just you know it's about get to the heart of the matter because you know that is what people will remember not not just information and data we get bombarded with that these days it's storytelling should be at the heart of whatever you do whichever subject you're studying whatever you do in life whatever career you go if you can nail storytelling you can do anything that's great looking for the one final question yeah your house has been for a while Thank you for taking us on a tour of the world and all your experiences. And now that it's coming to an end, I wanted to ask you about what it's like coming home. Uh, what's re-entry like after mm. someone's had an AK-47 in your head <laughs> uh, on the bank of a river? What's it like going down to Tesco and buying your broccoli or something like that? So. That's a very, very good question. Um, I think that that's something that, has come with experience in time. I, I, you know, the first time I got back from my Nile journey, you know, it was it was quite a culture shock. I'd been walking for nine months. I'd been through every experience you could possibly imagine. And then I suddenly got to the end. I got literally got to the end of this river, Mediterranean Sea. I was, you know, I was like, wow, this is great. But then 
it was almost an anticlimax because I was like, okay, there's nowhere left to walk now. And then, you know, a day later I was on the flight home and then it was, I think it was Black Friday. I didn't even know what that was, but it turns out I got to London and we were walking down, you know, Oxford Street, people trying to kill each other for, for a widescreen TV. And I was just like, what has life come to? This is just not, this is totally crazy. But then, um, you know, and you feel like, and it was the same feeling that I remember from getting back from an operational tour of Afghanistan where you're like, people don't care, you know, people have got no sense of perspective and you can beat yourself up about that as much as you want, but people still don't care. And uh, so you just got to sort of, um, you know, you take yourself from McDonald's or whatever and just sort of just ease into it. I don't know. You know, you have to like really just accept the fact that, you know, your journey is your journey. Everyone else is on their own journey. It doesn't matter, actually. It's about it's about doing it for the right reasons for yourself. And, and what I found, uh, I've, you know, as sort of my own reconciliation with all this stuff, seeing extreme poverty and, uh, and then you come back and you see extreme extravagance and overindulgence has just been like, just be grateful for what we've got, frankly, because that's what keeps it all in perspective. And the fact that you can come home and turn the tower, the, the, you know, the hot water tap on or um, it, uh, that always blows my mind actually for, for, for a bit when I get back. And I just try and remember that whenever I'm feeling a particularly, um, I don't know, if, I, if I'm grumpy, I'll just like, hang on, keep everything in perspective and be grateful for what we've got. Oh, thank you. Before we conclude this fantastic talk, you know, I've got to abuse my chair's privilege and ask the question, what's next? What's next oh. for Leveson Wood? What's the next big destination? Um, well, I've got about 15 journeys that have been my backlog now because of uh, COVID. But, um, but yeah, no, the, the, there's a couple of places that are still um, on, my, on my radar. Um, I, the next one, which I'm hoping is going to be happening quite soon, is, is India. I want to go and do a big journey from north to south across India. And um, I'd love to go to China. I've not been to China yet. So hopefully that summer I, I can go and investigate and have a look around and see what China's got to offer as well. So, But those are the two big ones coming up soon. Hopefully. Fantastic. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much for joining us thank today. You.